Okay, we're back here live at uh, Information on Demand, IBM's uh, conference. This is SiliconANGLE and Wikibon's exclusive coverage uh, with theCUBE, our flagship program. We go out to advance extracted signal from the noise. I'm John Furrier, the founder of SiliconANGLE. Join my co-host Dave Vellante, and our next guest is Michael Koalenko, who's the assistant professor at NC State, North Carolina State University. Welcome to theCUBE. Ah, good morning. So tell us about what you're working on at, uh, uh, at the university, um, and how does that relate to the data-driven analytics, social business theme here at IOD, which is hot. Okay, well, in, in the business school, what we're really concerned with is understanding how people make decisions. And here at um, IOD, we talk a lot about how data comes together, how we look at for aggregation of information and do analytics. But what we like to focus on is what's the next step? Analytics is one part of it, but you have to make a decision at the end of the day based on the information you have. So how do you go about collecting the right information and asking the right questions? So what we do is we work with students and with companies in training them how to do critical thinking and then to augment that process by using these technologies that are available to them. So we were uh, talking with Fred uh, Balboni yesterday, IBM, or old, we're old school, we were talking about the old days, and the language is coming back, you know, data processing. Decision support. Do you remember those terms? Yes. Yeah, decision <laughs> management. I, you know, <laughs> right? I, I, I mean, <laughs> what the heck? Yeah, I'm like, <laughs> living in a nightmare? Is this real? <laughs> I mean, these are all the same stuff, but different look and feel, different dynamics. Exactly. And, and the, the thing that I always have to caution people is this isn't, you know, my form of data decision support systems and those sorts of things, that the technology has really evolved with what we can do. And at the same time, you know, we, I, I've heard several talks uh, over the past couple of days about, well, there's all this new data. No, there's not new data. People have been saying things and commenting for years. There's now methods for capturing that information and now making use of it. So how do you do that? So the tools have to change to reflect that. Now, many times people are very comfortable with taking an information that is structured in nature. Again, uh, as your previous speaker said, if you said you, you look at Amazon and how they figure out what you like and what you don't like, it's very nice to look at that structured information and figure out different correlations. What we're mostly focused on now, though, is to take that unstructured information, which comprises, you pick a number, 80, 90 percent of the information out there, and figure out how to extract knowledge from that. And we think that there's a target-rich opportunity in that. Tremendous value, but you needed a different type of tool set to do that. Well, now that you have things like Hadoop, you have the ability to go in and spread your work amongst many machines in order to take in this information. We have tools that allow us to extract that information and to do brute, you know, very large um, indexing of unstructured text. Now we can apply context and specificity in order to extract the information we need. It's much different than the old data sets and cubes that we used to deal with in decision support systems. So I have to ask you, so there, there is new data though, right? I mean, think about the decision support system. There's certainly more of it, we can agree on that. Uh, uh, but social data's newish, isn't it? I mean, it's, uh, I guess well, your, your argument would be there's social data before, we're just capturing it now, right? Exactly, that's okay. exactly Fair my enough. argument. And I would say that, yeah, there, there's more of the you know, sensor data now, the, yep. the ways that we have phones, all the things that you can take from that. Yeah, that's new, but in a sense, you know, okay, I have this and I understand what's going on with it. What people have to transition beyond now is not only what's happened in the information that you've gleaned from that, but why did it happen and how can I change outcome based on it? To move away from just looking at straight correlations, but also to take in information now from these different sources and figure out, well, where's my white space? Where can I go now? What's not being said that allows me to drive new business decisions and new business models? So talk a little bit about the, you know, John, you're, you're making me laugh. You're talking about all these, these concepts and terms coming back. I remember in the early 2000s, it must have been 2002, 2003, HBR came out with a, an article on how the best decision makers make decisions based on gut feel. Um, and I laughed. I'm like, that, that's absurd. They're just not, you know, analyzing the data or they're not looking at the data the right way. And, you know, then, of course, Malcolm Gladwell comes out with this book, Blink, and sort of, you know, confirms that, that thinking. So take us back. I mean, was that just... Um, Nonsense? Was it actually no. real? Is it still the case? Um, help us, you well, know, we, squint we, through those. Well, gut feel, perceptions and misconceptions. Well, it, it, I think it, it, it's a, in a sense it's a misinterpretation of gut feel, because again, if you look at cognition and the ability to to organize information and create knowledge from it, it's a bunch of different inputs, right? And at the end of the day, you may subconsciously think it's a gut feeling, but it's experiential based, right? So there there is an anchor in data. 
Now, the thing that you have now, though, is the ability, you, you have a, a certain capacity, a finite capacity of taking in that information. What you want to do, along with the gut feeling, is augment it with these other tools. Let them do the heavy lifting so you can focus on knowledge creation and activity, actions from it. So I, I would say that yes, there was gut feeling, yes, you did do this, but if I look at it, it was all experiential based and you had data that allowed you to make that decision. Now you can de-risk that decision because you can collect more of it and focus on the hard things rather than the rote memory. So that's a great answer, and I, th I agree with you. I mean, it's, you're right, it's of course it's based on data. Now the data, in theory, should be better. So are we going to make better decisions with, with <laughs> less risk? I mean, I, I heard in the news this morning that the, the, the Obamacare website, you, you know, the, the person in charge of it was in front of Congress saying, well, we added more servers. Ah, uh, yeah, you know. Did I just hear that right? <laughs> we added more servers? You know, call well, Amazon. Uh, well, <laughs> well, really. Um, <laughs> <laughs> That's our government at work. Problem, really. We'll, okay, we'll, so we'll, we'll spend gonna, more money. That's will we make better work. decisions? Will we make, you know, we'll, 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 can we de-risk things? Or is it just that there's, things are happening so much faster, we actually face increased risk? Well, I, I think what you have to look at is, is data is one aspect of things. And if you're looking at decision making, the other and probably the bigger aspect of that is culture. All right? So if I don't have a culture that allows you to go in and ask good questions and to challenge the status quo, how are things going to change? The person who's heading, you know, we can speculate that the person who's heading that website could have said, look, you will do it this way and no matter what you find, um, you're going to continue down this path. All the data in the world wouldn't change that position, right? It was a cultural thing. Command and control is contradictory to a data-driven organization. And I keep hearing, you know, again, we hear this over and over again, well, we have data, we can make better decisions. Yes, you can, but will you be allowed to? Does the culture in your organization allow you to take that information and make a better decision? We are, so I was, on a, um, was awesome. doing a moderating a panel with the, the CEO of GE uh, in a couple weeks ago in Chicago, and Florian Zettelmeyer was there from Kellogg's Business School and, and his analytics side, and we were talking about culture, right? Mm -hmm. And the big thing was, you know, data scientists. Everyone's gotta have a data scientist, and that was kind of the big theme, and, and you know, his point was, Anyone can be a data scientist if the tooling is, you know, simple to use. Hence, we heard that yesterday. So that was the message here at yesterday. So, the, but the the point he made was, he said, he said to the uh, CEOs out there, if you're going to hire a CFO and the guy walks into the office and says, "Hi, I want to be your CFO," well, what do you know about finance? I don't know, but someone my, on my team will know finance. And his point was, everyone has to know data. You can't just say, I'm a CFO, and say, oh, someone on my team will take care of the numbers. Because mm -hmm. mm -hmm. then you can't understand the decision. So again, this is the this virtuous circle of, of innovation around personnel. It, it, it is, and it, again, the idea is what, it, at the business school, what we're trying to do is get people to become what we call, not data scientists, but data managers. Understand the technology that's available to you and how you can leverage that to make a better decision. We don't need you to be that data scientist that goes in and can do the statistical application on a data set. What we need you to know how to do is ask a good question and know how to extract the appropriate information to answer that question. And you should be able to, con you know, to converse with the data scientist, the IT organization, whoever understands the different technology platforms to get that information to you. So with more data, um, there's potential for more bias and there's potential for more politics and decision making. How do you foresee, you know, from a strategy standpoint, addressing that problem? Is, it, is that a problem? Or oh, it, it's definitely up? a problem and it's actually cause it's kind of interesting because what we do first when we, we deal with a company who comes into, who wants to start working with big data or with the students in the MBA program, is to first teach them about critical thinking. And by understanding critical thinking, one of the first things that you look for is bias and alternatives. And to be able to clearly articulate your problem statement and break it down and understand the subsets of questions, the problems that could come from this, the bias that's associated with it, and the alternatives to the decision. Once you're able to do that and understand the, the core of the problem, now we can start breaking it down and looking for the appropriate pieces of data to either support or refute the position. So it has to start there, then you bring the technology in. Now if the organization can't deal with critical thinking, they have bigger issues than big data. So you start with a critical thinking process mm -hmm. and make sure that those pieces are in place. Yes, absolutely. And well, you provide guidance, training, education yes. on each of those piece parts? Yes, because what we say is if we have all these things and you're able to do that, it enables you to now utilize big data in any way, shape, or form to answer the question. 
If you look at critical thinking, the critical thinking process and understand how you have to clearly state the objectives of the question, well, that sets you up for develop, uh, excuse me, developing your um, unstructured text analytic models. Now I have specificity and context. Now I can start going and querying my data, whether it be structured or unstructured, to try to bring that information together in the appropriate context. So it's a piecemeal approach. You start high and work down into the details. So once again, John, we see process trumping technology <laughs> in terms of the potential to screw stuff you know, up. function always works. Say, hey, is there lock-in? Yeah, but well, it works like, right? so <laughs> look like I can go with it. Um, Mike, I have a question for you on, on um, Marsha, our previous guest was talking about towards the end, you know, her passion around people-centric focus, mm -hmm. the social web and social business is people-centric, the humanization, love that, I love that all day long. But one of the things she talked about earlier that I want to drill down with you is new waves bring in uh, dynamics that destroys old ways. <laughs> so what do you uh, say to the folks out there that are both looking to change careers around how to leverage their, 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 their skill sets and to young people in high school who, quite frankly, are going through the book going, where do I go to college? What, should, what career should I do in? What major should I be in? Data science is not necessarily on the radar. Do they go math, do they go physics, do they go creative, all the above. What's your t advice to the young people out there and also folks changing jobs? Do you, do you like problem solving? If you like problem solving, you're going to enjoy a career where you start to look at information and putting things together to, to, to solve puzzles and to work on mysteries, those sorts of things. And you can become pretty much agnostic with regard to what vertical you want to go, and you may have a predisposition to be in one field or another, but overall, if you're naturally curious and you want to find out why things work the way they do, then the field of big data is just great for you. Any advice on disciplines? I mean, is it do a little creativity? Well, is it math? <laughs> is it economics? I mean, this is a, this is a hard, roadmaps for young people to, to navigate. Is it a DB, DB, DB guy, database guy, DBA? Uh, well, it's kind of funny that you, you know, because truthfully, um, you know, I, I'm an immunologist biochemist that does this and worked in a number of different industries before I started down this path of, of looking at how people ask questions and make decisions. So I guess my view of it again. You're born with it then. Well, You're either born with it. You're either born a data scientist I, I think, again, it comes down to the, this, this predisposition for problem solving and, and understanding yeah. that. So. Yeah. I mean, we've seen musicians uh, come sure. in and be amazing. We've seen folks who know multiple languages be great mm -hmm. data scientists. Mm -hmm. We've seen math geeks. So think about, you know, again, do you like to, to look at, again, puzzles? Do you like to organize things? Do you like to see how they, you know, sort, so to speak, in your head? I, it all comes down to, yes, I think there's a, a predilection to doing these sorts of things. And there are certain disciplines that reinforce that sort of thinking. So if you start thinking about STEM disciplines, they, they, there is a, a structure that they apply to it. That's not to say that you don't have the same thing in the language skills. Remember, I do unstructured text analytics. When I first started in science, I, I teased my mother, who was an um, English teacher, that I was going to delete the liberal arts gene. Well, what am I doing now? I'm doing unstructured text analytics based on ontologies and language in order to extract data. So. So what do you do with IBM? What's, uh, what what do, do I do with IBM? Um, what I do with IBM is I work with both um, the hardware, software, and Watson groups to figure out new ways of applying their technologies to business decision making. That is, what sort of tooling do we need to use? How can we make a better interface for the business user? Because one of the big things, again, in this democratization of data is that everyone's got to have access to it and know how to use it. So what we do in working with the students and the companies is we collect a lot of feedback about what works, what doesn't work, what do they have to change in the software. At the same time, we have new paradigms on how you deal with data and how you have to handle it from a technology point of view. How do you store it? How do you manage memory? Those sorts of things. So not only is it me in the business school with the business question, I have partners in the computer science question looking at memory and storage paradigms, as well as the engineering department to look at things like FPGA performance mm. and programming. So what we like to do is work with IBM and give them a continuum from the design stage all the way to the business application stage. Yeah, so um, we were talking, we were at Oracle Open World a, you know, a couple months ago now, and it came out that the average age of the enterprise app is like 18 or 19 years old. So we're talking today about social business. I guarantee most of those apps or none of those apps have anything that looks like social. <laughs> we were talking earlier with Marsha about how 
you know, applications have to change, the whole interface has to change, the user experience has to change. I mean, it feels like it's a complete do-over in terms of the interface and the experience. I, I think with the interface and the experience, yes, but it, you know, fundamentally, and this is one of the discussions we, I have a lot with the IBM group, is how do we look at data and how can we start treating data as objects? Because at, at the application state, what I'm doing is I'm, I'm trying to figure out the best way to get input. And then once I have that input, what form can I hold it in so now that I can rearrange it and use it in any way, shape, or form that I want? And some of the things that we have, even though they're 20 years old, are very good at that. So how, do I, how can I take that and not be so constrained in structure that it'll allow me to rearrange data, reorganize it, and utilize it in new forms? So at, at the end of the day, yes, there's some very good things that have, that have been around for a long time and we can leverage them and we have technologies now that can really accelerate it. Look at the DB2 blue stuff and how they're doing acceleration there. Okay, that's a great form of, of organization. Now how do I bring unstructured information into it? How do I organize that and how do I leverage that? So again, it's more of an interface question. Yeah, like you say, treat it as an object as opposed to some inane concept yeah. that I can't really understand that's decomposed into a block that's yeah. sitting somewhere, <laughs> somehow. Yeah. Okay, cool. All right, so final question for you is, um, what's the outlook for, uh, in your opinion, the future of decision support? Do you seeing automation, personalization, user interface? What are some of the things that you can point to that you say, hey, you know, we're, we're looking that it's on the fringe, it's on the, the lunatic fringe to, you know, mainstream uh, innovation that's right around the corner. What do you see those two areas? Well, uh, deep around the corner, lunatic fringe to, <laughs> to uh, like, just right around the corner. So it could be automation, AI, learning machines, et cetera. Well, and again, I think when you start, all of these things are starting to converge. And the, the question is, how much do you want the machine to do versus how much do you want the human to do? And where we want um, the machine to do a lot of the rote stuff, the heavy lifting of data and information, we want that, to, we, that's good for the machine to do. It's better for the human to focus on the decision making part of the program and understand because truthfully, even though we talk about cognitive computing, I haven't met a machine that can outdo the mind with regard to cognitive computing. But what can we do to get it to focus on the, the mind on decision making and less worried about bringing the information in? So we drive the technology with regard to getting it to understand the context and specificity necessary for the cognitive event that the human has to make. I've always been fascinated with artificial intelligence and, and ontologies and cognitive and learning machines. I think it's the, what Watson has proven to the world is you can actually put a, you know, put a face to that with Watson saying, hey, we can actually build this real-time analytic brains into apps. Mm -hmm. and I think that's something that we're watching really closely. Uh, Michael, thanks so much on the, uh, for coming on theCUBE. Really appreciate it. Thanks for your insight uh, and good luck with your work at NC State and great to have you on. This is theCUBE's exclusive coverage of IBM's Information On Demand. We'll be right back after this short break.